Yo, so we're in January, obviously, so this is extremely late, but where there is yen, there is yang. Where there is cereal, there must also be milk. And where there is the worst, there must also be the best. And while crazy enough, I didn't watch a lot of true shit over 2022, hence my top five worst of 2022, go check out that video after this. I'm pretty sure it's going to be in the description or the ending card. Who knows, but I couldn't even stretch that out to 10 because it just felt unfair to how shit those shows and movies actually were that were on the list. And I just didn't want to make it a list of Marvel Phase 4's filler arc. Oh yeah, we're still on that grind. I won't be doing a deep dive into this list though whatsoever. Most of these shows and movies that have come out, I've already come out with bigger and more in-depth videos already. So if anyone pops up and you're just like, oh yeah, right. Just go check out those after this. Oh, and my top five. Don't forget about that. But this intro has already been long as fuck, so... Number 10. Right? Already hitting you with the... Oh yeah, right. Prey was pretty awesome. A true, strong female character done right. The Predator series is an IP that has suffered from... Extreme apathy. After the release of the movie The Predator in 2018. God, what a colossal fuck-up that movie was. Remember Predator Iron Man? Right. Neither do I. Prey introduced a new predator species in a new environment that we have truly never seen before. A grounded David vs. Goliath situation. And while there's nothing new in that formula, it was an extremely effective method of storytelling when executed correctly. Which, Prey did every step of the way. The Predator itself is brutal, and with the change in time period, makes for some creative-ass kills compared to the boom-boom-pow-pow that the Predator series has turned into. And if given an opportunity to watch a Predator film without watching the original, this would be the movie I turn to. Number 9. Releasing late late December 22, hidden under the insanely visually stunning Avatar Way of Water, the menu was simply a tense and interesting watch. Anya Taylor-Joy and Ralph Fiennes shine yet again in a horror thriller satire type of a film. Of course, basing its satire on the personality of renowned chef Gordon Ramsay in our world, while also introducing elements of societal and class structures, and the effects that maybe that type of lifestyle could lead to an unsatisfied and privileged mindset. Which of course can sometimes seem so obvious, but man, the themes here are executed with such grace and class that makes the movie so digestible. No pun intended there. And it reminds you that the messages and the themes don't have to be displayed so on the nose in every single media that you're watching in order to get what the director or the writers are trying to tell you. Also, as somebody who is pretty shit at cooking, the food in this movie is immaculate. And I'm pretty sure they even tell you the ingredients if you want to dabble in it yourself. Yeah, if you're single and you know how to cook and need a guinea pig, give me a call. As I've said, the menu was a tense and interesting watch, and my eyes were glued to the screen in every single scene. Number 8. Man, that's crazy. Anya Taylor-Joy back to back. She was on a roll this year. As the box office suggested, it's unfortunate that there's not a market for movies like The Northman anymore. Easily better writing-wise, set-piece-wise, and cinematography-wise, than most big budget blockbuster movies that came out this year. The Northman was, well, my bad for using this analogy again, but simply a digestible movie. A classic revenge story set in the Nordic era with Vikings tearing each other limb by limb, with incredible and effective plot twists, and again, the cinematography is off the charts with this film. It's easy to forget with the assembly line of processed media that comes out every year from the same IPs you just watched a couple weeks ago, that film is an art, something that is taken seriously and actually worked on, a craft. And films like The Northman display that type of an idea in Hollywood that's maybe not completely dead. This is easily something that I recommend you watch before watching my review, because even if it's just the one time, by the time the credits roll, you'll understand that cinema isn't dead. Well, not yet anyway. Number seven. Uh, yeah, so no lie, it took like every bone in my body to not put this higher on the list due to my pre-existing bias. The Walking Dead easily has to be the best show of all time. And I guess there's shows out there like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. 
all made by AMC, which is pretty insane to imagine. But The Walking Dead, man, it is just built different. Season 11 Part 3 concluded the entirety of the original show if you don't want to include the spinoffs. And while the show took a major turn in pacing, the character priority, and tone since the death of Rick. Oh god, spoiler by the way. Season 11 could in a way be underwhelming from a lunatic and major stan of the show such as myself. Especially like me if you've been watching from the very beginning. But I imagine that the majority felt very satisfied with the conclusion of the series. And with Game of Thrones and Westworld showcasing to us the fandom that that's not something that is always given. But there are shows out there like The Walking Dead that hit it right on the mark. It's extremely sad to see this show go and while I have heavy, heavy plans for future videos regarding this show, for right now, sadly, it stays at number seven. Number six. Man, with all of the words I just said about The Walking Dead, you know how painstakingly sad and hard it was to judge The Walking Dead Season 11 and The Boys Season 3 as these two slots? Well, imagine I'm Homelander drinking some of Mallory's old breast milk. Yeah, that hard. The Boys just continues to get more and more insane as the show goes on, and with its two leads, Billy and Homelander, getting the main beef stick when it comes to the story and the development of this season, it was absolutely incredible. Giving Billy powers was natural and an encouraged twist of the show, not only adding to his character development by becoming the very thing he hates most, but now adding a layer to Homelander's character outside of his interpersonal conflicts within himself. The Boys has always strived off the fact of being able to balance different tones without taking away the integrity of the show. And well, that's no different in Season 3. One word. Herogasm. Number 5. I doubt anyone expected anime to be on this list. I doubt most of you guys even knew I watched anime, to be honest. It's been a while. But look at us. The more you know. Demon Slayer Season 2 was incredible from start to finish. Picking up immediately after the conclusion of the Mugen Train movie ending, the stakes, the animation, and the characters, as in most animes, get a significant buff after the success of the first season and the first movie. And what sometimes is something that's usually always lacking when it comes to shonen anime, the world building finally has some time in the spotlight highlighting different areas of Japan within the Demon Slayer universe and diving deeper into different backstories and factions of how you can actually even survive in a demon-filled universe. Not to mention the introduction of one of the best new characters in all of anime in 2022 in Tengen. The Hashira and the fights this season are top tier, even finding one of its episodes in the top five episodes of all of anime in 2022. If you've seen the show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, but you're down for an easily digestible anime, Demon Slayer Season 2 is your pick. Number 4. After, uh, mm, I don't want to say uh, mid-Season 2 and Season 3, because it's not that. Maybe underwhelming compared to the first season, perhaps. Anyway, Season 4 of Stranger Things, after a two-year hiatus, is back in, well, better than ever. The stakes have never been higher, and while the conclusion is still heavily predictable seeing how our crew of characters only has one Superman, the journey was by far way more entertaining and character-driven than our previous two installments. Hello, Hopper. Welcome back. And, well, welcome back, my favorite character in the entire series. Welcome back, Papa. While most of the characters obviously grew up with age, the range of acting has now grown. Some, well, more than others. But with the addition of Sadie Sinks Max last season and newcomer this season Eddie into our crew, who this season heavily revolves around, it picks up for some of the other, uh, underutilized characters. And our main villain this season, instead of being some CGI hive mind, is an actual character. It just throws in a different element that our characters haven't really faced yet. Except Billy, but I don't know. He wasn't really a villain, just more of a vessel. Anyway, the Demi-Gorgon is back, so that's more than enough to earn a top four spot. Holy shit, that was epic. Number three. I feel like I am forever and always going to get the title of this show messed up because the Mandela effect on this show went wild. 
to just go ahead and get the elephant out of the room, I'm going to reiterate the obvious. After the extreme fuck-up that was the ending of Game of Thrones, the excitement surrounding this new spinoff wasn't nearly as high and positive as it could have been. Well, still unfortunately is in everybody's mouths, and while I think that's something that will more than likely never be forgiven by the fandom, it was a nice surprise that this show was actually awesome. The characters were relatable. Somewhat. Well, as much as a character from Game of Thrones could be. The dialogue was almost just as on par with some of the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones, and while with the extreme budget that was thrown at this show, you just know it was going to look spectacular. And while no one could predict how dark it was going to be for some of its scenes, tone-wise and lighting-wise, my inspiration for Season 2 of Hot D is significantly higher compared to the level it was at the beginning when the show was announced. And well, I'm not complaining whatsoever. Go Rhaenyra. Number 2. I mean, come on, I'm not gonna sit up here and lie. Robert Pattinson as Batman... Nah, I wasn't really sold on it either, and Batman is my favorite superhero of all time. But what we got here? Well, this is fucking fantastic. This is truly its own unique and individual Batman film, and hopefully it stays that way instead of being swallowed up by the disastrous plan that James Gunn seems to have in mind. The Batman simply brought different elements to the table, bringing in a casually lesser-known villain in order to heavily focus on a younger Bruce and Batman that was being displayed throughout the movie. But easily the highest of highest praises that I can give this film was the display of Gotham. Instead of a simple ass and lazy ass New York setting, Gotham actually has some life and some personality in this film. Well, using life loosely. At the beginning, we couldn't imagine Robert Pattinson as Batman, and well, now I want him to stay as Batman. I'm tired of the unfocused misdirection at Warner Brothers, and it seems as if we finally found a mainstay. Well, if James Gunn has anything to say about it, fuck me. Number one. Nice. Alright everybody, let me just go ahead and keep it a buck here. There was really no competition when it came to the number one spot once I decided I was going to throw anime in here. For everyone that doesn't watch, Attack on Titan Season 4 Part 2 is basically the Infinity War of the anime universe, easily the most highly anticipated season to come out this year, and honestly could be a top 3 anticipated season by the masses in all of anime. Attack on Titan debunks everything that is wrong with Hollywood entertainment today, and displays all of the purest forms of entertainment that we now lack here in the West. This show, Attack on Titan, has the most incredible character developments and character dynamics that I have ever seen in a show. On par with even The Walking Dead. The stakes, the world building, the action set pieces, nothing is comparable in 2022 whatsoever. I could easily rant about how incredible this show is and how amazing it's put together with all of the grace and the hard work that everyone was involved with. But if you have watched the show, then you already understand what I'm talking about. And with Attack on Titan Season 4, the final season coming out in just a couple months, maybe even a couple weeks at this point, it's truly hard to believe, and it's actually incredible, that most of this season was purely set up for what's to come. And well, if you've never watched anime, or even if you have watched anime, and you want something for the mind, body, and soul, well, this is the show for you. Holy shit. Otherwise, that is the list. Even though it is incredibly late, I am happy that I made this. Just simply going down this list makes me realize that watching shows like Falcon and the Winter Soldier and She-Hulk are, well, not really worth it. It just reminds me that there's still incredible media out there, even if I have to go to different countries to watch some of it. Ooh, honorable mentions go out to Top Gun Maverick, which I haven't seen yet, and Everything Everywhere All at Once, because, well, I also haven't seen that. I haven't seen them both for different reasons, but anyway, that's my list. If you guys enjoyed the video, then make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. Make sure to get in those comments and let me know your top, well, mm, your top whatever of 2022. It doesn't have to be a top 10, it's truly not that serious, but you can include anything you want. I want to hear it. Anyway, thanks for watching and well, 
Otherwise, that's all the words I got for you today. Bye.